Be Wealthy and Smart, episode 822. into a world of wealth and financial freedom without budgets, boredom, or bosses on Be Wealthy and Smart. And now, here's your host, Linda P. Jones. Welcome to Be Wealthy and Smart. I'm Linda P. Jones, America's Wealth Mentor, empowering women and men worldwide to financial freedom. On today's show, we're going to talk about 12 income investments for 2021, because a lot of people are asking, where can I get income? Is there such a thing as getting passive income anymore? And what's going on with interest rates making lows for the 14th time and certainly bonds being at historic low interest rates? What are the options? Well, I found a really great Barron's article that talks about the best income investments for 2021, so I'll be sharing that with you. But before we do, there were a couple of things that really stood out to me that I wanted to point out to you because these are the kinds of statistics that just make you understand what is going on in the stock market because it's very easy to just look at a rate of return for the year and think that everything is healthy. But there are definite signs of caution and concern in the market. Here's one of them. This is from Bob Pisani from CNBC. He said 57% of the return in 2020 in the S&P 500 was from three companies. 57% came from Apple, Amazon, and Microsoft. Apple was up 81%. Microsoft was up 41%. Amazon was up 76%. And he also lists Alphabet up 31% and Facebook up 33% as two others that made a huge difference in the S&P 500. But when you have three companies impacting 57% of the return, that's not an indication of a healthy market. In a healthy market, you wanna see lots of companies going to all-time highs. You wanna see breadth in the market. You want to see out of those 500 companies, certainly more than three being healthy. All right. So that's one thing I wanted to point out to you. Another statistic I wanted to point out to you that was really interesting and caught my eye was the total market cap of the 10 stocks that I'm going to share with you now represents 24.2% of the market cap of all U.S. public companies. And there's roughly 6,000 U.S. public companies. So let me say that again. There's a market cap of just 10 companies that equals a quarter of the rest of the entire market cap of all U.S. public companies. Now, once again, that looks like a valuation that is so heavily skewed that it doesn't look healthy. But these are the companies that did exceptionally well under the COVID economy that we had this year. So it's no wonder because these are the ones that really expanded their market cap. These are companies like Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon, Baba, which is actually Alibaba, a Hong Kong listed company, but also on the New York Stock Exchange, Uber, Tesla, Tencent, another stock from the Hong Kong Exchange, and SoftBank, which is actually a Japanese company. But these companies also listed on U.S. exchanges, again, those 10 make up 24% of the total market cap of the rest of all of the U.S. publicly traded companies, and there's over 6,000 of them. So that was a very interesting statistic. Again, what it shows us is the value is very concentrated in just a handful of companies. Now that, in the past, has not boded well for the future of those companies. Believe it or not, this kind of extreme valuation has meant underperformance. At least it did back in the year 2000 when we reached a peak. They had underperformance for the next 10 years. So something just to be aware of. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but just something to look at in past history can often be an indication of what might be happening again. We don't know, but it's something I'll keep on sharing information with you about. 
All right, so let's get to this Barron's article. This was written by Andrew Barry. And it says, investors can still forge together an income-friendly portfolio, even with rates hovering near historic lows, 12 places to look. The bond market has been a barren field for income as fixed income yields remain stuck at historic lows. Yet there are rich pickings elsewhere if you know where to look. With rates just barely above all-time lows, yield opportunities are clustered in the equity market, says David King, co-manager of the Columbia Flexible Capital Income Fund. That includes energy pipeline operators, telecommunications companies, real estate investment trusts, and electric utilities. Pipelines yield 8% or more. Telecoms can get you 4 to 7%. REITs, 3 to 6%, and utilities, 3 to 4%. Many drug and consumer stocks also yield 3 to 4%. King says that income-hungry investors need to look no further than the so-called dogs of the Dow, the 10 highest yielding stocks in the 30-stock Dow Jones Industrial Average. The dogs now include Chevron, ticker CVX, Verizon Communications, symbol VZ, and Merck, symbol MRK. Outside the U.S., there are a number of yield plays in markets that have markedly lagged behind the S&P 500 index in the past decade. Opportunities are more limited in bonds. U.S. Treasuries yield under 2% and high-grade municipal bonds 2% or less. Most preferred stock is in the range of 3% to 4%, and top-grade corporate bonds yield 4% or less. The average yield on junk bonds is under 5%, and investors need to go to the riskiest corner of the market to get 8% yields. Well, we've talked before about stretching for yield, and you definitely don't want to do that. Even though there are companies that are yielding 8%, that does entail more risk. So anytime you're getting to that higher interest rate, you are stretching and taking more risk. So just realize that. It's not something to load up your portfolio with. All right, the article goes on to say, this is Barron's ninth annual assessment of income producing assets of the stock and bond markets in which we examine 12 sectors and rank them in order of preference. Our record last year was mixed. We were too bullish on energy pipelines and too cautious on treasuries. Here's how we rate the 12 sectors for 2021. Number one, energy pipelines. And it says the drop in oil prices and a glowing investor aversion to the energy sector hammered pipeline operators in 2020. The Alarian MLP exchange traded fund, AMLP, returned negative 32% for the year. Yet the industry is doing better than its stock suggests and could revive this year particularly if oil price bulls like commodity analysts at Goldman Sachs are right and West Texas Intermediate Crude rises to above $60 a barrel from a recent $48. There is strong free cash flow, low valuation, 8 to 10% yields, and the potential for higher commodity prices and volumes, says Greg Reed, president of Salient Partners, which runs the Salient Midstream and MLP Closed-End Fund, SMM. There could be significant upside. Many pipeline companies began stock buyback programs in the fall after some halted them in the spring in the wake of the pandemic. Closed-end funds focused on pipeline operators. Both master limited partnership and corporations trade at wide discounts averaging about 20% to net asset value and most yield in the range of 5 to 10%. The Alarian MLP ETF yields 11%. Among industry leaders, Magellan Midstream Partners, symbol MMP, at $42 yields 9.7%. Enterprise Products Partners, symbol EPD, at $20 yields 9.1%. And Williams Companies, symbol WMB, at $20 yields 8%. All right, that was the energy pipeline category. The second category is U.S. dividend stocks. I know a lot of you have been waiting with bated breath to hear about the dividend-paying stocks. It says, as investors favored growth stocks in 2020, high dividend payers languished. The Vanguard High Dividend Yield, symbol VYM, ETF, which is dominated by the largest high dividend stocks, such as Johnson & Johnson, JNJ, and J.P. Morgan Chase, symbol JPM, was flat in 2020 against a 17% return for the S&P 500. The ETF yields about 3.2%. 
One of the least popular parts of the stock market are established companies with good dividends, King says. That could change in 2021 if the recent strength in value-oriented stocks continues. One way to play it is through the dogs of the Dow, which had a poor year in 2020, returning negative 7% against a 9% return on the overall index. Historically, the 10 dogs have stacked up well against the overall Dow when investors rebalance their portfolio of dogs at the end of each year. Besides Chevron, Verizon, and Merck, current doghouse stocks include Cisco Systems, symbol CSCO, Coca-Cola, symbol KO, and Walgreens Boots Alliance, symbol WBA. The Columbia Dividend Opportunity Fund, symbol INUTX, which King co-manages, owns nine of the 10 current Dow dogs. For investors who are willing to trade off a lower dividend yield for better growth potential, there is the ProShares S&P 500 Dividend Aristocrats ETF, symbol NOBL, which yields about 2%. So I just want to say that the Dividend Aristocrats has been one of our favorites for a long time, but it has had problems this last year. The third category is Overseas Dividend Stocks. International markets are a great place to find yield because they have trailed U.S. indexes for 10 years. In addition, foreign companies tend to have higher dividend payout ratios than their American peers. We see much better opportunities outside the U.S. than inside the U.S., says David Iben, manager of the Copernic Global All Cap Fund. He points to telecommunications, utilities, and energy. Iben likes Electrobras, symbol EBR, of Brazil, a huge hydropower generator that trades at $7, or seven times 2021 earnings, and yields 4.7%. He is also partial to the Russian natural gas behemoth, Gazprom, symbol O-G-Z-P-Y, which trades around $5.50, yet yields 7%, and is far cheaper based on reserves than its Western peers reflecting Russian risk. He also owns Mitsubishi, symbol MSBHF, and Mitsui, symbol MITSY, two of the Japanese trading companies whose shares were purchased by Berkshire Hathaway, symbol BRK.B, last summer. The two companies have thinly traded U.S.-listed shares and trade below book value and yield about 4%. Drug shares lagged behind the market in 2020, European drug giant Novartis, symbol NVS, at $93, trades for 14.5 times projected 2021 earnings and yields 2.1%, while rival GlaxoSmithKline, symbol GSK, at $37, trades for 11.5 times estimated 2021 earnings and yields 5.4%. Broad overseas ETFs yield around 2%, including iShares Core MSCI EFA, symbol IEFA, Vanguard FTSE Europe, symbol VGK, and iShares Core MSCI Emerging Markets, symbol IEMG. The fourth category is electric utilities. The sector had a disappointing year considering the drop in interest rates, but 2021 could be better as investors gravitate toward an industry that will spend heavily in the next decade to develop renewable power. The utilities select sector spider ETF, symbol XLU, has generated a negative 1% return in 2020. Utilities could generate a 10% plus return in 2021, reflecting dividend yields averaging close to 4% and price appreciation in line with earnings growth. We see structural decarbonization, robust growth opportunities, a defensive business model, and solid yield underpinning an attractive outlook for the group, J.P. Morgan Securities analyst Jeremy Tonnet wrote in a recent note. He reviews the group as appealing. It is valued at an average of about 18 times 2021 earnings, a discount to the S&P 500 multiple of 22 times earnings. Tonit is partial to Dominion Energy, symbol D, now a nearly pure play regulated utility in Virginia with an ambitious renewable energy plan. The stock at about $74 trades for less than 20 times projected 2021 earnings. It yields 3.4% after a dividend reduction in 2021. In 2020, that resulted from the sale of a gas pipeline business to Berkshire Hathaway. Some utility stocks were battered in 2020, including Consolidated Edison, symbol ED, 
and PPL, simple PPL. Each fell about 20% while industry leader Next Era Energy, symbol NEE, a leader in renewable power, gained 20%. Con Ed at about $71 yields 4.3% and trades for about 16 times 2021 earnings. Duke Energy, symbol DUK, and American Electric Power, AEP, fetch about 17 times projected 2021 profits and next era 30 times. I just want to pause there and say, you know, energy is such a huge growth area that a lot of these have really reasonable valuations and seem like they're not going to be the ones that might be hit as hard as other areas. And they're already at bargain prices. So I would think that would be one of my favorite areas if I were looking at income. Number five, real estate investment trusts. Hurt by weakness in malls, apartments, and office buildings, the REIT market, as measured by the Vanguard Real Estate Fund, symbol VNQ, returned negative 6% in 2020. Industrial REITs like Prologis, PLD, that own warehouses were a bright spot, benefiting from the e-commerce boom. The Vanguard ETF now yields 4%. Interest rates are very low, and that bodes well for REITs, says Alexander Goldfarb, a REIT analyst at Piper Sandler. Real estate companies should get a lift from a stronger economy in 2021. Goldfarb is partial to mall industry leader Simon Property Group, symbol SPG, whose shares at about $83 yield 6.2%, and shopping center owners Kimco Realty, symbol KIM, at $14, yielding 4.5%, and Bricksmore Property Group, symbol BRX, at $16, yielding 5.3%. Bricks and mortar retailers remain essential, Goldfarb said. People can't get everything they need on Amazon. He sees Simon as a deep-pocketed mall survivor with a desirable portfolio and strong balance sheet. Owners of strip malls like Kimco and Bricksmore are getting a lift as more Americans prefer the convenience of buying online than picking up products at local stores. The New York City office sector was hit hard in 2020. One way to play a rebound is through Vornado Realty Trust, symbol VNO, which has a depressed price of $36, down 45% in 2020, a good balance sheet, and an attractive portfolio of Manhattan office towers. It yields 6%. Goldfarb likes Douglas Emmett, symbol DEI, which has what the company calls an irreplaceable office portfolio concentrated in the affluent western part of Los Angeles. The share is at about $29, yields 3.9%. The people who live and work on the west side of LA aren't going to Texas, he said. Number six is telecommunications. The two major U.S. telecom companies, Verizon and AT&T, symbol T, had a disappointing year. Verizon's shares declined 4%, yielding 4.3%. AT&T fell 27%, yielding 7.3%, one of the highest dividends in the S&P 500. Verizon looks to be the stronger of the two, with a better balance sheet and a competitive position in the U.S. wireless market. Craig Moffitt, an analyst from Moffitt Nathanson, upgraded Verizon to buy from neutral in early December and set a $66 price target. His view is that Verizon, which fetched a recent $58, is simply too cheap, trading for about 12 times projected 2021 earnings of $5 a share, half the market multiple. He sees high revenue per customer in 2021 and better roaming revenues relative to a COVID-depressed 2020. AT&T has expressed commitment to its dividend, but analysts like Moffat worry about an expensive iPhone 12 promotion and pressure on its large media business. At a recent $28, AT&T trades for only nine times estimated 2021 earnings. Overseas telecommunications companies are even cheaper than their U.S. counterparts. Copernic's Iben likes KT, symbol KT, one of the largest South Korean telecom companies, and China Mobile, symbol CHL, the largest cell phone company in China. Both stocks have badly lagged behind Verizon in the past decade. Both KT and China Mobile trade at seven times 2021 earnings estimates. KT at $11 yields 4%, while China Mobile at $28 yields over 5%, and has net cash equal to about half its market value. 
On Friday, after publication of this story, the Wall Street Journal reported that the New York Stock Exchange will move to delist China Mobile and other Chinese telecom firms to comply with a U.S. government order banning Americans from investing in companies that it says help the Chinese military. The delisting is due to occur by January 11th. In Europe, Deutsche Telekom, symbol DTEGY, at about $18, yields 3.7% and owns a large stake in T-Mobile US, symbol TMUS, that is worth nearly as much as its market value. The giant telecom has considerable debt. Our seventh category, convertibles. The bond stock hybrid securities befuddle many, but after their blockbuster performance in 2020, convertibles ought to attract greater investor attention. Convertibles returned about 45% in 2020 based on the ICE B of A U.S. convertible index, making them one of the best U.S. asset classes. The gain was powered by a huge gain in the share price of Tesla, symbol TSLA, which makes up about 10% of the $325 billion convert market. Tesla accounted for about 40% of the index's advance. Growth-oriented technology companies are well represented in the convert market, helping performance. Another boost came from rescue converts sold early last year by companies pressured by the pandemic, including Carnival, CCL, Southwest Airlines, symbol LUV, and Booking Holdings, symbol BKNG. We're calling for 8% to 11% performance in 2021, says Michael Youngworth, head of global convertible strategies at Bank of America. The market's heavy weighting in growth stocks makes it vulnerable to a pullback in the tech sector. Youngworth says that converts continue to offer a favorable risk-reward equation. You get more appreciation on the upside when stocks rise than you lose on the downside. The largest convertible ETF, the Spider Bloomberg Barclays Convertible Security, symbol CWB, gained 51% in 2020. It now yields 2.4%. Eighth category, junk bonds. Investors have piled into the junk bond market in recent months, buoyed by optimism about the economy in 2021. The result is that the ICE B of A high yield index yields under 5%, and investors need to take considerable risk in bonds with low-grade triple-C ratings to get an average yield of 8%. Junk returns in 2021 could top the 5% level of 2020 if the economy recovers and investor demands stay strong. Yet Martin Fridson, Chief Investment Officer of Lehman Livian Fridson Advisors, is cautious. High yield prices convey a level of optimism that is very difficult to reconcile with the credit outlook unless you count on continued Fed support on a level never witnessed prior to 2020, Fritzen says. Investors are pricing high-yield bonds such that the market is effectively predicting a 2% default rate over the next 12 months. This compares with 8% over the past 12 months, as reported by Moody's. So they're saying there, things are a little too optimistic. It goes on to say the largest junk ETF is the iShares iBox High Yield Corporate, symbol HYG, at $26 billion, yielding about 5%. The smaller Van Eck Vectors Fallen Angel High Yield Bond Fund, symbol ANGL ETF, yielding 4%, generated some of the best performance in the sector last year and over the past five years. It returned 13% in 2020. Large holdings include Carnival and Kraft Heinz, symbol KHC. The ninth category, tax-exempt municipal bonds. The market went from feast to famine back to feast in 2020. After a strong start, munis were buffeted in the immediate aftermath of the pandemic and then mounted a strong rally into year-end, finishing with a return of about 5%. With yields near historic lows, though, it's tough to make a strong case for munis. An index of AAA-rated 10-year munis yields just 0.7%, not far from the record low of 0.55% in August. And that index yields just 75% of the 10-year Treasury note, near the lowest point in 20 years and below the average of close to 100%. The yield is less than half of the U.S. inflation rate. Lower-grade munis trailed their top-grade brethren in 2020, but have rallied in recent months. 
One winner lately has been the financially troubled Metropolitan Transportation Authority, which operates in New York City's subways. Its 35-year debt now yields about 2.75%, down from 5% in May. Top-grade long-term munis yield 1.5%. Peter Hayes, the head of the municipal group at BlackRock, says a shift in issuance to taxable muni bonds, which now account for about 30% of the new issue municipal market of about $450 billion annually, should provide a tailwind to the tax-exempt market in 2021. The largest muni fund is the $80 billion Vanguard Intermediate Term Tax Exempt, symbol VWITX, which yields 2.3%. One alternative to the Vanguard Fund is the parametric TABS 5-15 to year laddered municipal bond fund, symbol EALTX, which follows a similar strategy to parametrics popular separately managed accounts. Laddering refers to buying munis of different maturities in the same portfolio as a way of diversifying. The parametric fund, which is owned by Eaton Vance, has topped the Vanguard Intermediate Fund over the past five years it yields 1.6%. Closed-end muni funds yield more, reflecting leverage, and generally trade at discounts to their net asset value, or NAV. Current discounts in the mid-single digits are less attractive than the regular double-digit discounts that were prevailing before 2020. The BlackRock Municipal 2030 Target Term Trust, symbol BTT, at around $25 yields 3% and trades at 6% discount to NAV, It is set to mature in 2030. The lower grade Nuveen Municipal Credit Opportunities Fund, NMCO, trades around $12.75, yields 5.8% and trades at an 8% discount to net asset value. Number 10, taxable municipals. The formerly obscure market has exploded in size with issuance totaling about $170 billion in 2020, double the amount in 2019. State and local governments that want to refinance older, high-rate, tax-exempt debt before maturity must do so in the taxable muni market because of federal tax law changes in 2017. That has been the main driver of the taxable issuance boom, and it is likely to persist in 2021. For investors, the appeal is that yields generally exceed those on like-rated corporate debt. Yields are in the range of 1.5% to 5%, depending on maturity and credit quality. There is a lot of demand, and we expect that to continue into 2021, says BlackRock's Hayes. He notes that the overwhelming percentage of demand comes from institutional investors, unlike the tax-exempt market. There are three closed-end funds specializing in taxable munis that yield 4 to 5%, reflecting leverage and longer maturities. They are BlackRock Taxable Municipal Bond Trust, symbol BBN, Guggenheim Taxable Municipal Bond and Investment Grade Debt Trust, symbol GBAB, and Nuveen Taxable Municipal Income, symbol NBB. All three traded premiums to their net asset value. The one large open-end fund is Mainstay McKay U.S. Infrastructure Bond, symbol MGVAX. It yields 1.5%, reflecting shorter maturities and no leverage. The largest ETF is the $2.2 billion Invesco Taxable Municipal Bond, symbol BAB, which yields about 2.5%. Our 11th category is preferred stock. The preferred market, which has been booming, presents difficult decisions for investors weighing risk and return. Nearly all of the $350 billion sector, which is dominated by bank issuers, trades at a premium to face value. Currently, preferred securities have little upside and considerable downside if rates rise. Most are perpetual securities, meaning that they have no maturity dates. Preferred securities issued at $25 a share now often trade in a range of $26 to $28. Yields are generally 3%, calculated more or less to the early redemption or call price of $25 occurring in the next few years. Some even have negative yields. Preferred securities can normally be redeemed by the issuer at face value five years after the offering date. New issues are coming to market with yields of about 4%, down from 5% in the spring. Bank of America sold $1.1 billion of 4.375% preferreds in October, symbol BACPRO, and it now trades at $26 for a yield to call of 3.2%. 
Public Storage, a self-storage REIT, and a sizable preferred issuer sold $175 million of 3.9% preferred, symbol PSAPRO, in November. It trades at about $25.50. One high-yielding preferred that still looks appealing is Curate Retails, symbol QRTEP, 8% issued due in 2031 that trades around 98, just below its face value of 100. Curate owns the QVC home shopping channel and is controlled by media magnate John Malone, who holds about $85 million worth of the Curate Preferred. The largest ETF, the iShares Preferred and Income Securities, PFF, trades around $38 after a 7% total return in 2020 and yields 4.8%. Closed-end funds focused on preferred yield more, reflecting leverage. The Nuveen Preferred and Income Opportunities Fund, symbol JPC, trades about $9, yields 6.8%, and trades at a 3% discount to its net asset value. And finally, our last category, treasuries. Government bonds lived up to their billing as a stock market hedge in 2020. Rates plunged as stocks collapsed in March, and the treasury market finished 2020 with yields not much above the pandemic panic lows and down half a percentage point or more for the year. The 10-year Treasury note yields 0.95% and the 30-year Treasury bond 1.7%, and short-term Treasury bills yield near zero, reflecting the desire of the Federal Reserve to hold short rates around zero for the next few years. Barring unexpected weakness in the economy, Treasury returns in 2021 are likely to be low and could easily be negative if inflation is resurgent. The 10-year Treasury could fall 8% in price if rates rise by a percentage point. Some investors may still want to hold Treasuries as an equity hedge, the equivalent of a put option with some yield. Long-term Treasuries roughly match the S&P 500 in 2020. The iShares 20-plus year Treasury bond ETF, symbol TLT, returned 18%. The iShares TIPS Bond Exchange Traded Fund, symbol TIP, holds Treasury inflation protected securities and could do better than regular Treasuries if interest rates rise. The iShares Short Treasury, symbol SHV, holds Treasury bills and yields around zero. It offers an alternative to money market funds. And end of article. Just to recap really quickly, we saw a lot of volatility in the income space. You have a lot of stocks that have done poorly, which are now considered to be dogs of the Dow or the worst performing stocks of the Dow 30 index. And those have the highest investment yields. And sometimes as a contrarian, that has worked to be a good investment strategy to pick the worst performing dogs of the Dow and get those high yields, as long as you have a well diversified portfolio. So I'd recommend doing that in an ETF. So Again, to summarize, our 12 top income investments, according to Barron's, were energy pipelines, U.S. dividend stocks, overseas dividend stocks, electric utilities, real estate investment trusts, telecommunications, convertibles, junk bonds, tax-exempt municipals, taxable municipals, preferred stock, and treasuries. If you haven't yet subscribed to Be Wealthy and Smart, hit the subscribe button and you'll be notified as soon as new podcasts are available so you never miss one of them. And we still have our holiday giveaway going where you have a chance to win one of 25 prizes. 10 of my You're Already a Wealth Heiress books signed by me. And that book is on the list of all-time best wealth books by Book Authority. You also have the opportunity to win 10 of my Wealthy Mindset Blueprint audio sets valued at $197, and five people will win a one-on-one wealth mentoring session with me. All you need to do is leave a podcast review for Be Wealthy and Smart on iTunes. That will get your name in the drawing one time. And if you've read the Wealth Heiress book, leave a book review on Amazon. That will get your name in the drawing two times. And winners will be announced on the January 13th podcast. So make a note to tune in that day and listen for your name and see if you've won. That's all for today. Until next time, live the good life and be wealthy and smart. Thank you for listening to Be Wealthy and Smart with Linda P. Jones. 
share the wealth and tell your family and friends about the show. Check out our website, blog and social media for more riches at www.bewealthyandsmart.com.